Um, one of the key pieces of advice given to inventors, if anyone is an inventor out there, is to invent something for your target market. So something that you would use. Don't, you know, I shouldn't come up with the next most absorbent tampon. I'm not going to use that. Uh, so it's better to invent something for your target market. Um, Nicholson's character in As Good As It Gets, you know, that woman asks him, how do, you, how do you write women so well? And he says, I think of a man, and I take away reason and accountability. Um, <laughs> Do you ever target people who are not you? Do you ever write for an audience you feel that is not made up of you? Or how do you write characters who are so different from you? Um, that's a, a tough question. I, I, I actually don't know if I, I think that I, because I come from acting, uh, when that's where I start, started, in acting you always find your, yourself in the character. So you always try to find what about this character reminds you of yourself or is, is like you so that you can merge with that character in some way. Um, so I think I do the same thing when I'm writing, which is basically I try to find, uh, I try to write a character um, who is, is, I try to find myself in the character. I mean, there's a, there's a character in, in the book uh, in, in my book where, where I wrote this man who, so my father when he was, uh, used to work for Verizon Customer Service and there's a story in the book about how he got fired because he ended up having this argument with this very belligerent racist guy on the other end of the line who uh, said he couldn't understand what he was saying and refused to speak to him and my father, uh, get, so it becomes this uh, sort the of... The man could not understand what your father yeah, was saying. Yeah, the man could not understand what my father was saying and my father was trying to speak to him and you know and and he, he was saying, like, I don't want to talk to somebody in India. And my father was like, I'm not in India. I'm actually in Tampa, Florida. And um, so it becomes this argument and this conversation. And, and when I was writing it, I, I knew how to write my father. And, but I didn't know how to write this other guy because, uh, you know, clearly I never met him. And this was a part of the book that was the imagination, right? So it's like I had to create this character who was having this argument with my dad and what he would say. And I could turn him into sort of like an, just a stereotype of a racist American and just sort of make him say things that like, you know, you would be like, well, this is what a racist would say or this is what a bigot would say. But then I thought, well, no, I have to give him specificity. And then it was really just about my, me inserting myself into him and finding out where his humanity comes from. And it came from the idea that like, I've been as frustrated with Verizon customer service representatives <laughs> as anybody, you know what I mean? So his bigotry comes out of like this frustration of not being able to get his problem solved, which inspires his bigotry, you know? And, and so that... <laughs> I thought of bigotry as particularly inspired, right. but that you know is what well. I mean. It's so, it's so he, 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 let's say, he, let's say he switches over to his lesser self. You know what I mean? Like, like his, his less evolved version of himself. And so, um, that's where I found that character. I found it in myself. I found like if I was this guy and I was talking to somebody I couldn't understand and I was frustrated and I had to really, I had to go pick up my kids from school and you know what I mean? And I, Just and I, what, raise, yeah. And so like, how would I behave to that? What might I do if I was, and then, you know, it's, it's an acting exercise for me because it's very similar acting and writing to me. Like I basically inhabit the characters as I'm writing them. So it just, you know, it, it is a lot of times, uh, even if it's, even if he's like you know uh, a dwarf astronaut, I'm like, oh, what would I do if I was a dwarf astronaut? You know what I mean? So that that's how I approach it. Uh, did you hear about the? Um, dwarf astronaut. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> was it the midget that escaped from prison? The psychic midget that escaped from prison, looking for a small medium at large. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> It seems that Indian American males, maybe females as well, but I'll speak since we're a panel of, uh, of three uh, Indian males, have a uh, penchant for storytelling, for being rock and tours. Uh, you're seeing this with uh, Rajiv Joseph and his plays, with your books, with uh, these one person shows and stuff. Do Indian or, or South Asian males in America have a particular knack for this, or what's informing this explosion of? our types of people? Hmm. I'm like, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, I, right. I, uh, I, I think, um, 
I think there is a nest. Well, I, I agree with your point that that writing is very performative, uh, and I think that there is a. I think there's a kind of performative aspect to. I think especially when you're dealing with Indian men being in America, because there's something performative about being ethnic in America too. Like the way you're asked to perform it in a way, it becomes it becomes a character in a way that you inhabit. I mean, I think that's why. Mm. I think even in times like as a as a comedian, I'm sure that probably is a go-to for us is to talk about our parents a lot of the time because that becomes performative. It's like we are an Indian family. We are seen as an Indian family. That's what people perceive us. And then you play that role because you've sort of been assigned that role in a way. And then then it gets trickier then because then it's like now that people have are assuming a sort of level of understanding when it comes to Indian culture, that's not the point of differentiation Differentiation now. So now you have to, what else do you have? So now I have been queer to my advantage in that respect. I have that. Now there are a lot of queer Indian people. So now what do you have? And so when I'm working on a book now, it's not like it was when I was, this came out five years ago, where the very nature that this is a book that is talking about Indian American sexuality is, is, a, is a new thing. Now, as I'm working on the book I'm writing on now, it is really looking at generations of Indian people of, of, of several years in and seeing where they are now and what's funny about that. So I think in a way, like Indian men, I think that's just that there is something performative about being an Indian man when you're in Indian culture, but then it becomes heightened as a result of being in the States. I was going to say, uh, who are your influences? I mean, you know, uh, when you were writing as an actor, as a writer, as a comedian at large, larger than just a comic or whatever, but a comedian, who are your influences? How did you get to where you are? Um, you know, I... I uh my when I was writing um, Sakina's Restaurant and um, all that stuff, I, I think my influences sort of were solo artists like you know Eric Bogosian or John Leguizamo and and people like that, or people who were sort of uh, telling very specific stories about their you know, um, and and I think that um, I when I first started writing, I kind of when I was first writing monologues and this book, by the way became a book, but it started off for me as monologues that then I uh, turned into uh, short stories or, or essays. Uh, but it was sort of, you know, like I, w I would look at Bogosian as sort of like my, um, kind of the guy who was doing what I wanted to do in terms of, of, of monologue writing and stuff, you know. But then I realized like his his point of view was also, you know, one of like sort of, I mean, he's, he's uh, you know, Armenian, but uh, it was it was very much about a New York kind of white male sort of you know narrative story that he was telling, which was not my story. And and you know and, and again going back to the thing about being South Asian, like I think the the quest for me and I and the, and the thing I've searched for in this book, not searched for, but but sort of opened up that question for myself is what is that to be a South Asian male in a culture that you know because what happens here is that like on one hand you have the 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 the, the sort of larger the large the society which is dominated by sort of white male culture which tells you like this is what it is to be a man and i talk about it in my book like my image of masculinity in hollywood was like the fawns when i was a kid which is sort of like the image of american masculinity sort of based on james dean from the 1950s you know so like that was my one image of masculinity and then the other image of masculinity that i had was my dad who was a shopkeeper and who was an immigrant and couldn't speak the language and had trouble navigating in the culture and so one, I, I didn't feel like I had access to the, 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 the culture where I was like, oh, I want to be the Fonz. And it was like, you can't be the Fonz because you're brown, you know? And then the other one, I was like, well, I don't want to be my dad. So uh, who, do, who am I, you know? Who, who, who do I get to be, you know? Um, I was straight, so I didn't have that going for me. The gay. <laughs> I think in 2008 or 9, it's for you instead of against you. That's a change. But I was, so, I, so it really became a question of what does that mean? You know, what, and what, what is that masculinity look like? What, what is that, uh, you know, and, and, what, and what is his shoe size, you know? Well, in, in our San Francisco interview, he yes. said something that really surprised me when he said, this is the hardest thing you've ever had to do. Is that actually what I'm saying? Was it, uh, uh, oh yeah, that's insane. Insane. Okay. Ninety-eight degrees. Right. I'm sorry, Cincinnati. Cincinnati. I should know this. Thank you, Vikas, for that. Thank you, Straight Brother, for that. Um, you said actually that writing this book was the hardest thing, and I would have thought that, uh, and I expressed it at the time that a one-person show, performing it, etc., was going to be the hardest thing. But is it because? 
Uh, you have to make it pop off the page. I mean, things can be scene funny or character funny or line funny. Yeah. They always say that comedians and comics, whatever the differences are. Some some people say things funny, and some people say funny things. Right. So did you feel like you had to just say funny things yeah, when you're writing this? It, the thing is, I'm a performer, and that's my, you know, like my editor uh, said to me, she goes, you know, with all my writers, I always tell them to go and read your stories out loud yeah. to understand if they work. And she's right. like, you're the only person that I'm going to tell, don't go read your stories out loud <laughs> to see if they work. Because for me, that was the crutch that I like always hold on to, which is that like I have control over the story. I have control over the narrative. I can read it and I can perform it and I can give you the the experience that you paid for or came to see by virtue of inhabiting it in my body, right? And so, but then when you write a book, that book goes off into the world and is no longer attached to you. You're, you have no control over how people interpret it or read it or what inflections they give or whether they get the jokes or whether they don't. And so as a performer, that's very um, uh, unnerving, you know, to, to sort of have this feeling of like, I have to make this work even when I'm not there. You know, and, and my experience up until I wrote this book was that it was, I was always, there. I was there. I was right. there to, to carry my, to, to make sure my child, you know, was, was getting seen the right way that it, want, it should be seen. And so um, that I think is just, uh, that's why I said it was the hardest thing because it was about writing something that I knew that was going to go out and then it was going to be, it had to, it had to find the humor or the story or the thing had to work without me being in the room, you know? Right. So the writing had to do the heavy yes. lifting, yeah. so to speak. Um, so you you spent years as an editor, 10 years as an editor at uh, Random House, HarperCollins. So you had to buy a lot of books. Now, an interesting side note here is that, uh, well, why don't you tell it? Well, I, this is an interesting side. I actually met with Asif many years ago when he was to get him to do a book. And then I wasn't allowed to buy the book. And I was very upset about this. Uh, but yes, so that, that, that did happen. And I, that's why I'm very glad that, that, that he has a book now. Because that's it's come full circle. Um, there's a quote that, uh, that goes, the greatest paintings have already been painted. Uh, would you, how would you say that that quote applies to books? What is the state of literature today? Um, I don't agree in that with that statement in terms of when it comes to books. I think people are doing really exciting things. I think that um, I think that uh, one thing I wish happened on a greater scale is just that people Americans don't have a really high sense of world literature of the state of world literature. Um, I think it's a country. It, it, it exactly so. Um, so I think that as an editor, that was one thing I was always, if I would find a writer who's actually right, who was not American, who was writing somewhere else, and it was really compelling, I really try to publish that work if possible, because it's just that we need to give voice to people like that. Um, but I think, no, I think, um, you know, like, a lot of the books that people think are probably like fluff in a way aren't. Like, for example, uh, like Bossy Pants, Tina Fey's book is actually a really good book. And and like Lena Dunham's book, I actually haven't read the entire thing. I read the excerpt that was in The New Yorker, but it was really well written. Like it was very, she, like the, the people are actually putting the effort in. And so like, if you're going to do a book, like obviously you approach this book with a lot of thought and a lot of like the right stories you're going to tell and the way you're going to do it. So I think people do actually put in a lot of in a lot of the work. When a book comes out and you can tell that the writer, if it's a celebrity author, didn't put a lot of effort into it, then that shows, and I think people react accordingly. But I think that there's a lot. I mean, I think it, when it comes to f funny literature, I think people are doing really exciting things. I don't think all the great books have been written in that. Stuff. In, in that way, then, so Tina Fey and Bossy Pants is there, right? Because she is so big and so famous, and so her voice is there. So it is kind of a, you're sort of in that, another region of, you know, you're, I don't want to say you're not famous. You, you know where I, what I'm saying, though. You're saying I'm not famous. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's, check that. Okay. Um, you're saying Tina Fey is more yeah. famous. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to say it. As is Nicholson, Brando, several people. Yeah, that's, that's, I just want to get that across. Okay. Good. Good to, good to know. Um, what advice, as uh, two people who have put out books now, do you have for aspiring writers? Um, and interestingly, at least I believe it's an interesting question, which is when you meet with, with people, can you tell what the flaw is going to be in the pitch? Or like, man, this person, just based on the way he or she looks, very compelling, but this is going to be a mess structure-wise. I mean, can you tell, or, or did you get to that point? 
Well, you do have to- I mean, it just, it depends. Because sometimes it depends what the kind of book is. So for example, if I was working with an author who's gonna have to do a lot of media appearances, then you, the author has to be ready to do media appearances. But there was one writer, there was one author in particular I'd sign up, um, she was really charismatic and very eccentric in a lot of ways, and she was writing about uh, Sylvia Plath. And it was kind of a perfect marriage of author and subject matter. And she looked, this this author is very beautiful. She looked like a cross between uh, Leah Michelle and Amy Winehouse. She had this like very kind of uh, nice sense of style. And I just knew there were going to be some challenges to her doing this project because it was going to take a certain amount of interviewing and digging through all these old files and things. And that would be challenging for her. But there was a sense I had there, because you typically buy nonfiction books on proposals. So she had a proposal of what she wanted to do. And I knew there would be some challenges logistically in terms of how she'd figure it out. But there was something about her as an author that was very compelling. Similarly, when I worked with an author who did a big biography of Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, that book was a big hit, he was a staff writer for Vanity Fair. So that obviously came to play because he had access to a lot of people who were going to be very integral into the way that the book was constructed. And so that did have a bearing. But but then, you know, like fiction, typically you get a full manuscript. And you do have a conversation with the author just to see if you align creatively on what you're trying to do, but sometimes you do find in that conversation that the author is a little bit of a whack job, and and then you just you just you weigh whether or not that matters. You know, like if the book is really good, who kind of cares? You know, but but it, 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 it there is a kind of different bar set between fiction and and sometimes you get an author and you're like like Joshua Ferris is like a dream author for Little Brown to have because not only is he a great writer but he's incredibly handsome and he's very mediagenic. So like it's kind of like the jackpot where they found like a writer who's like really talented, very good looking and like it all kind of worked out so we just found two right here so there yeah. um, what advice would you have as someone who's written? how long did this book take you to write it's all sort of a blur now but it's uh, I think it took me about two and a half years okay yeah which was much longer than, than I had than intended you but I was also year. I thought a year and then it ended up being much longer I was also doing other things so I was like yeah, you were a correspondent for The Daily Show. Sure, you were show. on uh, ER. Right. I was on ER. Yeah. And so those two things alone <laughs> uh, took up like about a w two or three weeks. weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Minimum. Even though it's The Daily Show. So what, uh, what, what advice would you have for aspiring writers? And after having gone through this process, was it what you expected, the process? Obviously, it was longer. Uh... Yes, I mean, it, 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 no, it wasn't what I expected, but I am very uh, happy with with what ended up being on the page and what ended up being published. You know, I, I think there is that thing of like, there's the thing the artist imagines, there's the thing the artist creates, there's the thing that the audience sees, and then there's the thing that the audience remembers, and none of those things are the same. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I said it with movies too. The movie you write, the right? Movie exactly. Movie so movie I think, and I think it's the same thing with a book. You know, it's the same thing with anything. I think you know. So ultimately, the thing that I ended up creating was the sum total of like the two and a half years of experience of like you know, of, of sort of you know there were stories that I started out with that I wrote that I went back a year and a half later and like rewrote because I felt like I knew more about what I was writing now and, and you know, all that stuff. So, um, but your question was, you know, to aspiring writers, I would say, yes, you know, tell the story. Like, you know, just just tell the story. That's, that's what's important. And I think we need more storytellers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, especially South Asian storytellers, I would say, you know, uh, uh, to keep on, um, in all mediums, uh, to keep telling uh, the story and and uh, furthering that narrative, you know. The, uh, one, one thing I would add too is that uh, that advice that you have to give people to is that there's this whole myth of the muse, the idea that you have to wait until the muse strikes you for, for something to get done, and the truth of the matter is that you just have to sit down and you have to do the work. I mean, that was that was that was a piece of advice I got from a uh, kind of writing and publishing mentor of mine when I first moved to New York, which is that you just you're either doing the work or you're not. You know, so you're either sitting down and actually writing, and not just thinking about writing, but actually sitting down and doing it, or you're not. And you have to really treat that as no gray area, like a no gray area space, because that's the only way you get things done. And and the thing too is that it, it's it it is it's where the, this is where the kind of thing intersects with being South Asian too is the idea that. Um, not all the good stories have been told, but somebody's going to tell those stories. So if you feel like it's really important that you're going to do it well, you better get cracking because somebody's going to do it. So, and I don't mean that in the kind of petty sense of like, oh, I had that idea, but it's like, well, then if you okay. have, if you can control, but yeah, but in the sense of if you can control the narrative of sorts where you're like, well, I think I have a voice about this and I want to be the person who does it because I think that's really integral to what I'm, what I think should be accomplished, then you kind of have to sit down and start doing it. 
Yeah, I'm just building off of that. I want to just say that, like, you know, there were long periods of time where everything I thought I was writing w was crap, you know, and 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 it was very difficult. It was, you know, uh, there was a period of time, like in 2012, where I was literally sitting trying to write, and it was just like. And I would talk to my editor, and I'd just be like, "There's nothing. I'm not writing anything that's any good, and there's nothing I want to send you." And you know, and so there were long periods, months of time where I was just sort of like, "I don't know. I have nothing. I have nothing. Everything." I, but I would try to write, and I would just keep on, you know. And it was, it was sort of, it was, it was. Uh, when when you were saying that, it kind of reminded me of that period of time, which is really. Uh, sort of drudgery, just kind of going through it, just trying to keep right. writing, and then you just look at it and you're like, "This is all rubbish," you know. I'm so glad to hear that, and 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 I'm serious, I am, because it's 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 inspiring to hear that. That you know, you hear. I heard Larry David give a speech about how he hates writing. Right. He's the best, best comedic writer in history. He hates writing, and um, you, I, I watched Dimitri Martin, who's one of the best one-liner comics of our generation. I went to an open mic and I saw him do about 50 one-liners and. 48 of them were horrible. Right. It was like, that is not funny at all, but you know that he's going to shape these right. you know, into something. So I think it is, it, it's inspiring, I think, to hear there's that, that, that it, there's so much drudgery involved with it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I'm going to misattribute this quote. I think it's John Bircher, but maybe it's Samuel Beckett. But there's a quote I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's, 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 um, uh, writing a novel is like, and I'm going to butcher the quote, too, so this is really great delivery on my part. But it's, it's that writing a novel is like driving in the fog. Um, you can only see as far as your headlights, but you can make the whole journey that way. Dr. And what, it's who? It's, it's Dr. Dr. Rowe. Okay, it's neither. Okay, <laughs> uh, thank you. So, uh, but it's, Indians know all doctors. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. exactly. Uh, Wait, but did you say it's Dr. Oz? It's Dr. Oz. Dr. Oz. It's Dr. Dr. Phil. Yes, exactly. Dr. Dre. Um, he was actually talking about... Talk <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Spin doctors. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dr. J. Yeah, exactly. Dr. Doctor. But, but I think that is true, like the sense that you're doing it, but, but that implies that you're working. You know, like even when you're, when you're tinkering and you feel like it's not going well, you're working though, you know, and that's part of the process. So. Well, you, you gave me some stat that it was like 85% of the public thinks it has a book in it yeah. or something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, what advice do you have? To, like he's saying just write, do the work. Is there anything in particular where you would say from your years of, you know, experience? Well, I mean, this is, not, this is no great surprise and no great wisdom here, but I, I'm always shocked by the number of people who want to be writers who don't read. Like, like, like they, you have to be reading because that's the only way that you understand not only what others have done so you don't re replicate it, but the idea that you, don't, you understand how stories are told. And you have to absorb that by osmosis in a way or else you don't really progress anywhere with what you're trying to do. So that's why I think, that's why I typically like to alternate between reading like what is, would be deemed a classic book and a contemporary book just because you see some of what the great books are but then you see what people are actually out there doing right now you're like what are people writing about how are they doing it so that's very important you are uh, writing in a, uh, various forms of, fe of media and they, they say that movies are event based and TV is character based how do you um, modify your writing style that way because a book is a thing we, we always express so much you know like how do you write the wire how the heck do you write that show and whereas you know you can sort of the wall or you know Pink Floyd are like oh, it's, it's the best album ever but I could see how maybe Roger Waters did that I have no idea how David Simon would write the wire would write the wire how do you write TV and is the process different from you know, you've now written a one-person show that became a movie, you've written a book, you've written stand-up, you've written all these things. Yeah. How's um, it different when it's a serial and it's character-based? I mean, I just worked in the writer's room, uh, and it was my first time writing on a TV series, and I worked in the writer's room for The Brink, which is this HBO series that's coming out next year. Um, that's with Jack Black and Tim Robbins. Jack Black, Tim Robbins, uh, yeah. And, uh, and, and Melanie Kanokoda. And Melanie Kanokoda, yes. Um, and... Um, it was very much, that was very much sort of like throwing ideas up onto a board and kind of, you know, like, again, we had, a, we had an outline. We had a sort of a Bible of what we wanted to like, where we wanted the season to kind of go and how we wanted to structure it. And then it was really just about, writing collectively is different because when you're writing collectively, you're kind of throwing about ideas and bantering off of each other and, and using each other's sort of comic inspiration to come up with ideas and, and stuff. And then, and then, oh, that's funny. We all laugh. You know what I mean? And that, let's try to do this. And, um, but uh, writing a book is a very, uh, you know, is a very lonely process. And it's, you know, I found that's what it, it was. It was uh, 
it was much harder that way. Yeah. Are there things depicted in, in pop culture that show what it's like? Is it like 30 Rock? Is that kind of similar? Or like, because like with Entourage mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and, and the Seinfeld arc about pitching a sitcom and all that, it is actually kind of like that. I mean, I don't score as much as Vince does, but living <laughs> right. in LA, it is kind of, yeah, that's kind of accurate. I mean, would you say that there are, uh, there are things that people can read or have access to that would show people what TV writing is like? I mean, I don't know what I don't know if there's stuff out there that you can read that tells you what TV writing is like, but it is. I mean, it it, it is. Um, you know, yes, it's kind of like Thirty Rock. I think it's. I think it's a much more. I mean, look, when I worked at the uh, all the years of the Daily Show, I find that um, it's a little bit of it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of sort of like people kind of goofing off and sort of like you know like having like a basketball hoop in their office because they need to just kind of like do that in order to get the juices flowing and then you have this kind of also you know comedy writers are a little bit of sort of like a weird bunch of sort of like Artistic kind of, you know, characters who autistic or artistic, both, okay. both. Um, uh, Just live in Boston. You know, yeah. like like that, that, right? You know, who 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 sort of go off, and and this is something that I, you know, you probably as a stand up are, are much more familiar with. This I'm not a joke writer, so it's very difficult for me to write jokes. But the people who are, it's a remarkable thing that they do and I sort of watched them for years of The Daily Show and it was like you would just come up with an idea mm -hmm. and then they would go off like alchemists right. and come back with this little joke you know um, <laughs> about it or you would sit in a room and they, we, in The Daily Show we have the writers have what's called a gang which every, you know the, they'll be like gang and you know so and so's room and everyone gets together and they just they're like like Obamacare boom 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 and it's just joke 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 about it or, or like what the story you know what I mean and so that to me is a very um, uh foreign kind of concept. concept of how to write. I don't write that way. I'm much more better. I'm much more better as a writer. I'm much more better. Um, I'm much better in, in narrative form and sort of like allowing the story to dictate where the jokes come from, you know? Well, you were in Million Dollar Arm. And so I kind of think of it, I, I, good segue, I kind of think of, it, of writers as, pitch, as pitchers. I mean, yeah. there are, there's your starting pitcher, there's your setup man, and then there's your closer. And there are, you know, I'm a, as a writer, I'm very much a starting pitcher and I'm a closer, but I'm not a setup man. If you bring a joke to me, I can't do anything with it. I'm like, that's your joke, have a good time. Right. But I can, con I can conceptualize, I can ideize, I can, I can ideate. And I can close, yeah. but I think it's finding where in that process you are. Like, are you a setup man? Can you can you punch up a joke? Yeah. You know, can you close a joke? I'm, I was always like, they're like, we need to end the sketch. I'll end the sketch. I know how to end it. Right. And I know how to begin it. I don't like the middle because that's where the work is. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't like the middle. When I work with other writers, I like them. I, I'm the guy who like, I like the second draft. I like I like like whoever I'm writing with to write the first draft and maybe just because I'm lazy right. so like I want them to write the first no, draft too, and then I can come in way. and then I will punch up and, and change right. things and, and move things around I can see what the structure needs to be in, or like where it okay. how it punches the best you know awesome at mandavala.com I'll send you my draft then and you can punch <laughs> it up you can punch it up for me that'd be great uh, to what extent you, you both live in New York City to what extent uh, does New York inform your stories I mean is it a character do you write against the backdrop of New York are you aware of that I know you've gone on various hiatus and you've left the city but to what extent does new, being in New York like you know when you receive a MacBook it's like designed by Apple in California there's something to that is this designed by Rakesh Sathyal in New York I um, just think that the the resources you have as a writer in New York it's the community of people like like next weekend I'm uh, you know part of a marathon reading of Moby Dick where like all these different authors come together and read like 10 minutes from Moby Dick over the weekend and I it will go to that and there'll just be a great lineup of writers because they all live here and they're all going to be participating and they'll, yeah they're like yeah I'm sure I'll swing by and do that they all live in Melville they all live in Melville. <laughs> uh, and I uh, but I, th so that's just a great resource. I mean, th it's funny that you ask that because I don't typically really write about New York, um, but I think that it is um, a really just helpful resource having that community of people. I mean, I, I yes, I, I love being, I, I, and I spent most of my uh, adult life in, in New York. And, you know, even when I was in, um, for example, when I was in acting class, uh, one of the great things about it was that I would get, get to uh, be in class and watch people uh, do scenes from Chekhov and Moliere or, you know, or Ibsen or whatever. And you would, and, and even just by virtue of being in class, you would get inspired by uh, those things. I mean, I remember once I was, when I was working at Sakina's restaurant, there was this story about my mother that I was trying to write and I couldn't figure out what it was. And then um, 
this is, it, there was a somebody was doing a scene from the seagull in class and uh, there was a line in there where the woman says to uh, I forget the character's name but she says women never forgive failure and I thought that's it and then I literally went and re wrote the entire piece that night based on just that one thing of women never forgive failure and so like stuff like that happens when you are allowing yourself to be exposed to uh, to all of this stuff you know going to the museum or whatever to a reading or to you know but then on the other side of it like I don't think I would have actually finished this book if I hadn't gone to LA to like do the brink and been stuck in this apartment with literally nothing to do and was sort of stuck there with no windows and just kind of you know oh I had a window but it was looking over like a, a tree you know and so like we well, actually have those in LA yeah they, they do have a few. Um, and it was and it was great because it forced me to kind of just the last leg of this the kind of the you know that 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 last mile and a half that I had to run was I was able to do it by going to LA and there were no distractions because New York also offers a tremendous amount of distractions and so if you don't want to write there's a lot of reasons yeah. to not write. What's the craziest thing you ever heard on the streets of New York City? <laughs> <laughs> so true story <laughs> I was walking down 72nd Street one day and there was a guy standing outside the Broadway dance studio uh, an African-American man and he was standing there and he was on his cell phone <laughs> And he and, and as I walked by, this is what I heard. He was speaking to somebody, and he said, um, "Well, my woman done left me. My motherfucking heart is broken, but I'm gonna get up there and tap dance." <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I want to thank Asif and Rakesh. I'm wrapping up. Is there any, uh, they can follow, uh, I'm gonna, um, we're gonna take two questions from the audience and we're gonna wrap up. But they can follow you on Twitter, at Asif, A-A-S-I-F, and please buy his book. It released last week. Uh, it's number one, yes, it's number one in the religion section on, religious humor section. But it's not, it's not the three in immigration and emigration. Oh. So like import export yeah, type business. And mine's number ten in religious homo. Yeah, it's very nice. It's very good. You can follow Rakesh at Rakesh Satyal, and uh, you can follow me at Funny Indian, but that doesn't matter. Okay. We'll take two questions from the audience. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, right back here. Uh, Question: You guys have been talking about kind of premeditated material when you sit down and write, but what about improvised material? Um, and specifically on the Daily Show, when you're interviewing people um, out in America. Yeah. How much of that is, I know I'm going to ask them when, I know how I'm going to react when they search certain things? Well, improv is a different animal, I think, you know. I'm oh, sorry, improv is a different animal. Um, it is, uh, we always go into those interviews uh, with prepared questions because we are professional journalists. And, um, <laughs> and, then, and then anything can happen. And so that really is more of like my performer training than writer training as much because you're really kind of just taking whatever's happening in the moment uh, and trying to trying to spin with it you know so that's uh, the, I don't consider myself a great improviser by any means but uh, you know sometimes we do have these moments where, where people will just go off onto a tangent or something that we can't predict and it is about that that's when our work becomes really interesting actually I'm getting the signal from Arun. We have to wrap. I'm so sorry. But are you available for questions? Are you hanging out? Or are you just like sure. running out the door? Yeah. Okay, we'll adjourn I'm out outside. here. Outside. Outside and ask questions. <laughs> Guys, thank you very much. Another round of applause, everybody, for Rakesh and Alpha. Thank you. Thank you.